it's important to understand attack motivations. If you're doing an incident response, you have to think about what is happening and why would the attacker be doing this? So looking at the motivations for why somebody would be doing something is pretty important to the whole process. One motivation is economics. In the early days of computers and incident response, this was not a big motivation. Looking at the economic gains that someone can make becomes really important. Someone might gain by looking at data, looking at some experiment that makes it easier for them to do their work, or it will help them establish a business and help it to thrive. So economics is becoming a bigger motivation even within the academic world. State-sponsored attacks to help businesses in competition is becoming a more common occurrence. Start thinking about this kind of thing. Typically, in the academic world, we've not worried too much about this, but it is something that is happening more and more, and it is becoming a threat. PR issues continue to be a problem for academic sites. Attacking and defacing a website is not unheard of. This can become an issue for the university, depending on what happens to the site. If someone doesn't like you, they might try to embarrass you in the public's eye. Personal vendettas. We've had incidents in the past where people have left but were disgruntled for one reason or another. Then they tried to access our systems, only to find they still had accounts on those systems. Granted, this has to do with not having a good exit process, but this still causes an incident. Now, some of these things don't happen as much as they used to. Our exit policies and procedures have improved, but they are still motivations you need to consider when addressing an incident. 20 some years ago, experimentation was the main motivation we were seeing in incidents. People just out there seeing what they could do. Also, it's not uncommon for these attacks to happen as part of training. Academic sites are easy to access a lot of times, so they're used as a training ground or test bed for the real target. The person might not care anything about your site. They're just using it to figure out how to attack the site they're really interested in. These attacks may just be using you as a launching point. You're not the target. You're just the base that they're using to attack the real target. They obviously don't want to go after someone directly. They need a host to use that will help hide their real identity. They're going to go through multiple systems and try to confuse things that way before they get to the real target. The added benefit of this is that you might have some really powerful resources that they can use. Now with an understanding of some of the motivations, let's talk about some of the vectors they use to get in. A good definition of an attack vector as a path or means by which a hacker or cracker can gain access to a computer or network server in order to deliver a payload or malicious outcome. The landscape of attack vectors is changing a lot due to two-factor authentication. What's two-factor authentication? Two-factor authentication adds a second level of authentication to an account login. When you have to enter only your username and one password, that's considered a single-factor authentication. Two-factor requires the user to have two out of three types of credentials before being able to access an account. The three types are something you know, such as a personal identification number, PIN, password, or a pattern, something you have, such as an ATM card, phone, or fob, something you are, such as a biometric, like a fingerprint or voice print, with more and more systems adopting this type of authentication, you're seeing a change in the vectors being used. Prior to the wide adoption of two-factor, stolen accounts were the nightmare of all the academic sites. So what would happen is that individuals would use the same username and password on multiple sites. Add to that, a lot of users would have scripts that would have these same credentials in them or have them accessible in history information all of this being very unsecure. The problem with this is how it can affect multiple sites. One site gets compromised, but then because of poor user practices, it allows the attacker to get into multiple other sites. The worst part about this is, you don't even know you've been compromised until the attacker does something that alerts you. For all you know, up to this point, you've had only valid users on your system. One thing here at NCSA that we have started doing is to use a system like Bro that begins to profile users. 
It will track things like what IP they are normally connecting from or what time of day they usually connect. So if this activity suddenly changes, Bro will alert the admins that something might be going on. Along with profiling systems, the use of two-factor has really reduced the effectiveness of this kind of attack. Stealing passwords and attacks are becoming more of an issue at academic sites. This is something new. In the old day of the institutions, it was something only industry needed to worry about. But we've had a few cases now. Insider attacks can be all sorts of things, from pretty mild-mannered trying to get some to state-sponsored things like we talked about in an earlier video. Students actively trying to mine information and send back to their sponsors. This is an important attack vector to consider are not yet set up to deal with. They are in on a legitimate account, and they are pulling information and sending it off. If you don't have good monitoring systems in place, that there's unusual activity going on, watching system usage and storage or something like that, then you really have no idea what is happening on your system. Software vulnerability is another huge attack vector, and there is really no good reason for it other than zero-day attacks. There's all sorts of information out there about what the vulnerabilities are and what you need to do to mitigate them. The only excuse for this is that you didn't have the time to get them in place and that it's usually because you didn't have a plan for patch management or you didn't assign someone to be responsible for it. With that being said, we understand that small projects don't always have the time or resources to do good patch management, but be aware, this is a huge vector. Alerts come in many forms. One of the most common is, gee, that doesn't look right. Well, we get a fairly high number of alerts from our monitoring systems. We also get a larger percentage from our users, admins, and others who are on the system just telling us something doesn't look right or isn't acting right or something along those lines. These individuals are really critical to your whole incident response plan. Figure out ways that make it easy for them to report something. Admins letting you know something is going on is a really good form of alert. System administrators usually just have a sense of what looks normal and what doesn't, so really utilize them. If you have poor system performance, a lot of times that's an early sign that something's going on. For example, usually the first thing people do with their own personal computer starts chugging away on something is to pull up the system monitor and see what's going on. The same is true for any system. You'll want to look to see if something unusual is happening. Any numbers of problems that we have seen have been due to traffic patterns or port access or locations we didn't expect. Unexpected data flows are another good indicator. Pay attention to these kinds of things, but also be aware of trends and patterns. We've noticed that over breaks, we suddenly get alerts because students have gone home to their home countries and they're logging onto the system, and it's flagged because the connection is coming from a foreign country. Clearly, you might want to have alerts set up for things like countries that are blacklisted, but there might be other suspicious activity you see because of unusual traffic patterns. Storage filling up is another big one. A very common alert is to suddenly have the disk filled up when you weren't expecting it. Usually, there's something behind that. There is reason for the disk being full. It could be a process that went weird or some other problem. Those can usually be figured out pretty quickly. But sometimes it indicates something else is going on. People being active at the wrong time. This is where a profiling system like Bro is useful. If a user normally logs in only during business hours, and suddenly they're logging in late at night or weekends, that could indicate a problem. Yes, you have to be that paranoid when you're responsible for incident response. Well, system administrators and users are a very important source of alerts. One of your goals should be to develop alerting mechanisms and an alert system that outperforms them. Hopefully, you'll get to a point where your monitoring system is telling you more about what is going on than your system admins. That's when you know you're being successful, when you are capturing more alerts that way. Just make sure that those alerts are not false positives. You also get a lot of alerts from other partners. These could be partners that are doing related activities. They are seeing things on their own systems and just want you to be aware in case you might be seeing similar activities. Or they might have seen in their logs that their intruder was accessing your system 
or the attack was coming from your site. The reverse should be done, too. If you see something one of your partner sites might be interested in, you should contact them as quickly as possible. That's why, in a previous video, we talked about establishing these relationships and developing a call list. It's a lot easier to contact someone if you know who to talk to. Also, you are more likely to be trusting and accepting of a call from a partner site if you know who you're talking to. When there is a relationship established between the parties, information passes more freely and openly. When you know the people you're dealing with, and they know you, there is an inherent concern for well-being that develops and translates into better security. You will also get a lot of vulnerability alerts from vendors. Whenever they tell you about something, you should take a look at it. Always do the investigation that is needed to determine if you are at risk for the vulnerability they notify you about. If you would like more help with building a security system, please contact CTSC. You can get contact and other information on the CTSC website, trustedci.org. CTSC Online is made possible by funding from NSF, grant number OCI 1234408.